Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This piece has been supported by an unrestricted educational grant from BioMeriu. Well, hello and welcome back for EBPOM Ireland Day One Lunchtime Session. So I'm Desiree Chapel, your host. I'm a CRNA from the States. I'm also Vice President of Clinical Quality for North Surrey Anesthesia. I'm joined by Professor Monty Mythen, uh, Professor of Critical Care and Anesthesia from the University College London, Professor Mike Grocott, Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care from the University of Southampton, and Vicki Morton, who's an advanced practice nurse practitioner from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Clinical Quality Outcomes Director at Providence Anesthesia. First of all, I just, I just want to add our thanks to Biomeria, who are a relatively recent sponsor of Empom. Without our industry sponsors, we wouldn't be able to keep the prices of our tickets right, right down. We also wouldn't know about what's coming over the horizon uh, from the point of view of new initiatives. But also because of their generosity and those of you who buy tickets, we continue to keep all of our educational materials free and open access to the less well-resourced world. So thank you to our sponsors and thank you to all of you. So I'm just going to go to our website for a second to highlight the section where you'll find Biomeria. But one of the things we're going to highlight as we go along within their education section, you'll find some external resources. And Biomeria have been supporting the No, K-N-O-W, A-K-I, campaign. And they have within there a video that we're not going to play you in any length now, but it highlights this campaign, which we're going to be discussing in this session, which is all about a greater appreciation and understanding of how common acute kidney injury is and how it can translate into chronic kidney disease. So I'm just going to come out of there now and take you into some slides that we prepared to discuss as a, as a pivot point, the relatively recently published um, perioperative acute kidney injury in adult non-cardiac surgery joint consensus report of the Acute Disease Quality Initiative, also known as ADKI, and the Perioperative Quality Initiative, also known as POKI. Now, please do, if you choose, have a look at that. It's all open source. It's published in Nature Reviews Nephrology. Uh, so you can get in there and look on all of them. I'm going to highlight a few elements from it as we go through our discussions here and reflect on where we are with post uh, perioperative AKI in our various different institutions. Now, for this discussion, we've agreed to focus on two consensus statements. That's consensus, consensus statements 7A and 7B. And consensus 7A talks about the incidence of, of kidney and, and non-kidney adverse events, but it also throws in there some abbreviations, and I'll come back to the consensus statement in a second. It starts to talk about not only PO-AKI, i.e. post-operative acute kidney injury, it also talks about PO-AKD, which I must admit before this process I wasn't as aware of, which is this idea that now there is post-operative acute kidney disease, and now I think we're clear that there are people who can transition all the way through to chronic kidney disease. So the incidence of kidney and non-kidney adverse events is increased following post-operative acute kidney injury, POAKI, or post-operative acute kidney disease, POAKD, in particular patients with surgery associated AKI or AKD are to an increased risk of new or worsening chronic kidney disease which is associated with increased long-term mortality. So I can be quiet for a while now, because I'm going to ask, if I may, Desiree, uh, all of us to comment from our perspective, and I'll go last, where we are personally with regards to that statement, where we think the people around us are with regards to that statement, starting with you, Vicky. Yeah, it's probably about a year and a half, two years ago, we really started looking at our AKI rates, mainly in cardiac surgery, which then trickled down to several other th service lines, and notice that we had a, a pretty high unacceptable rate. Cardiac surgery was 13%. Unacceptable, of course. Nobody was really following it, and I would hear things in rounds by saying, well, there's a bump in creatinine. We'll give some fluid. It'll be fine. And it was just kind of let go after that. And so really starting to talk about it with the group and rounds, and we put together a, a, a separate work group for acute kidney injury. Um, awareness, talking to the perfusionists, the CRNAs, and just talking about the, the, and bringing about the awareness of it and what needed to be done 
Now, here we are a year and a half later, and we're down to 2.1% in our cardiac surgery. So bringing about the awareness, this paper is great. We've actually talked about this this paper um, most recently, probably three weeks ago, and just keeping it at the forefront, but also for the patients, because I have found that I would round on patients and I would say acute kidney injury, and they'd be like, wait a minute, what do you mean I, my kidneys are injured? And they would have no idea what that meant or that it was even you know in existence in their in their condition can i just clarify those numbers again so you said it's cardiac cardiac and when you started it where was it when you started 13 percent that's one three percent which is not that unusual right in the literature yeah and when it went down to 2.1 percent i think you said the only thing you changed was awareness yes well that seems like a tremendous <laughs> fantastic a lot of discussions. Novel and awareness. Yes. Hence, awareness. The, hence the No AKI campaign. The yeah. first thing we need to do is to know uh, about right. it. Yes. Well, I was, before you go on, Mike, I was just going to ask as far as like sharing of the data and sharing it with the providers, because it's one thing to share it, say, hey, you know, we have a problem, but like, how did you communicate? Because that's what I think, find is a real difficult. Yeah, situation. well, we have monthly meetings. Um, and so at our best practice meeting every month, we would go through the data and at the table would be the surgeons, anesthesia, perfusionists, nursing, nursing CRNAs, administration. And it was being talked about, it was being said, but then it was forgotten about. And so when we put together our AKI work group to really dig into every single chart and figure out what went wrong, where could we have done better, and then f communicating what those things were um, and what we were finding. We were finding a lot of patients coming out of the OR, at least two liters, you know, negative, um, bone dry. And um, it, it, we just made some changes. And a lot of it had to do with fluid, but goal-directed therapy beyond just fluid um, hypotension, awareness, all of that, and what we needed to do differently. Um, so, you know, we continue to improve. Mike, what about you? Uh, well, I think we're on the other end of that journey. <laughs> As in, we haven't really properly embarked on it, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, was it that fluid and hemodynamics was the main answer? Because clearly, yes. clearly awareness is yes. no magic. Those are the two main, the, the two main uh, issues that we were having, yes. And methotoxic drugs, let's say? No, no. no. Mm -mm. Well, so I learned a lot in the pokey adkey process, and I think Shay, I recall frequently talking to our juniors on critical care, looking after post op patients, and saying, "Oh no, you know, renal injury is not so bad. Mm -hmm. We get them over it. Maybe only five percent, less than five percent, end up on long term renal support. So isn't that cool? Ninety five percent do really well, and not really sort of occasionally caught bits and pieces in talks, but not really appreciating until we had the opportunity to review all the evidence in Cambridge. The obvious notion that, that there's, if you fall just short of that, you've still got a pretty high risk of ending up on renal support, maybe weeks or months down the line. And there's a gradient in between. It's not, it's not a binary thing. Sure. So personal journey from doing that, what I wish I could now say is, you know, we've measured everybody and we monitor everybody. And we, um, uh, frankly, we're not there yet. Uh, it, it's on the to-do list for our parental medicine service, but we've had a few other things to do, like COVID <laughs> and all the rest yeah. of it. Yeah, we've got a lot but, of uh, things to do. <laughs> yeah, but I'm very impressed when I hear the sort of stories, you know, like, like your story. And, and slightly guilty that we haven't pushed it further up the list. I think it helps when you have somebody looking at the data constantly in real time, you know, not a half a year down the line or a year down the line, but real time looking at the charts and picking out those things that, you know, hey, we could have done this better, holding pe people accountable. Obviously, through Top Med Talk and all the conversations we have, and Monty and I, of course, talk about this, and I heard about after you guys came back from uh, the consensus gathering, that I started beating the drum just where I was uh, personally in our practice and just asking, starting to ask questions like, who, who knows our rates of AKI? What's really interesting is that from our anesthesia group perspective, and again, this is very American centric, you know, um, we are uh, anesthesia care practice, so we have CRNAs and uh, anesthesiologists, but started asking, you know, who do you guys know this? And like, we've been asking the hospital for a while. It's something that we, everybody, again, Mike, to your point, it's like, People know what's probably happening, but we don't actually have the data to show what it is. And so, again, just trying to educate on hemodynamics personally, I think, was a, a big thing for us. Learning to figure out how do we get our data and working with starting to work with the hospital administration more closely. So um, I talked to our CNO uh, just recently and said, you know, I'm really concerned that we don't really track our AKI. You know, what from your all's perspective, what do you see? And she's like, oh, we see it all the time. 
we need to start you know capturing that and so we're working together now to create a process for capturing and doing kind of what vicky to her point and then on our side of educating and making our providers aware um, that's kind of what we're doing in, in my personal so we should clarify when we're talking about the definition of acute kidney injury we're talking about the definition that requires urine output and requires a change in creatinine so they're usually variables that are readily available certainly the laboratory creatinine if it's measured and repeated is readily available and once we get into higher care areas it's readily available the sort of idea of the campaigns with awareness is to say could someone please communicate that to everybody more effectively and, and it sounds as though you you you're there Vicky I got the impression you're not there Mike um, we're working on we're you're doing, working we're on doing, it yeah working on it it's high journey. on the list for us <laughs> <laughs> so you're working on it as I list and we're working on it because we although we have a fantastic electronic health record the data extraction is always a little bit harder so I think while we continue to you know say we should know more about acute kidney injury because it's not benign that's a that's a laudable objective we'll, we'll get on later and later in the meeting we'll discuss the novel biomarkers that are supposed to give us a much earlier warning of this but in the first instance it sounds as though awareness makes a big difference I, I must say I still get the impression that lots of people that I work with don't necessarily still believe yeah. that it's bad uh, I totally agree I mean whenever I've asked you know a lot of the providers you know what do you think your experience oh, no you know I'm sure there's little little bumps but I just don't think people want to believe that and then do, do you think that there are problems later down the road and no one really wants to commit to it and answer to that well it happens a lot later doesn't it which we'll yeah. come on to later yeah. on we don't part of the discussion Mike was there many situations where we had no data to report on so we don't know if anyone for example gets acute kidney injury following a scope or sedation right. which we'll come on to in the meeting or following certain types of x-rays or day case surgery we only know the bit that's in cardiac for, right. for example I guess what well, the other thing that struck me at the time is it's not just about the kidneys yeah. as in the, the consequences of the acute injury, kidney injury and potentially acute kidney disease are also significant cardiovascular and to a degree cerebral vascular morbidity yeah, there's another infographic in there that the crosstalk between the kidney and the rest of the body means that once the kidney is hurting you're probably hurting a lot of other things in, in parallel if I may this I was going to take us through these four consensus statements which have been touched on already these are the consensus statements for the recommendation for the prevention of post-operative AKI the interoperative strategies and, and I'm going to suggest and Vicky's touched on it already that we go round and comment on each of the consensus statements so the first one is we recommend not using restrictive or zero balance perioperative fluid regimens in major elective surgery except in specific circumstances because if there's one thing we think we know from the large Australia New Zealand led trial of many thousands of patients is these regimens are associated with increased post-operative acute kidney injury and we graded that as a grade B evidence with a strong recommendation whereas I'm, uh, I'll come back to it at the end but I think we're still seeing zero balance and fluid restriction as an objective some of our practitioners absolutely was the practice and they everybody firmly believed it was the right practice again having a lot of discussions looking at the literature having discussions with perfusion who I mean they're good perfusionists but they've been doing their job for many many years and I don't necessarily think it's complacency I just think that they believe that it's the right approach um, but they don't get that feedback you know they never get that feedback and so now when you have somebody kind of looking at it the data and the practice and bridging it and figuring out okay what do we need to do differently um, they were willing to listen thankfully and, and change practice but I think that we all kind of get set in our ways and and people are sometimes afraid to broach those topics with professionals um, and we can't we can't be like that we can't be functioning in silos we have to have those discussions yeah I mean I, I think we've known this for a long time, at least inferentially from the goal-directed fluid therapy studies. Um, I think we got a whole wonderful series of anecdotes when we uh, introduced enhanced recovery uh, and there was that sort of linguistic 
uh, slightly tortured avoidance of fluid overload versus fluid restriction. And, and actually, Henry Kellett was always about avoiding overload, but it was somehow translated into fluid restriction and, and a lot of people that appealed to them. And then we started to see, I think we talked at previous meetings for the first time in very benign surgeries, fluid restricted patients turning up on the ICU needing renal support. And then relief was the uh, delightful foil at the end of that, which said, actually, here's the trial and please don't do it. And I have to agree with you 100%. I think the terminology of restriction just really took off. And, you know, even with zero fluid balance, I think people probably lean more towards restriction because that, you know, they could understand overload and that. And so, I mean, I feel like whenever I look at protocols, because that's what I'm doing, collecting protocols, and if they're about four or five years old, all of them say if they don't have access to advanced hemodynamic monitoring, restrict fluids. Right. They may or may not put, you know, a certain number on that. I will say that I, I talked to uh, a group one time and they had access to MPOG, which is the um, multicenter perioperative outcome group started in Michigan. And they had month by month feedback for their rates of AKI. And there was a, a new person there that had started. He saw the ERAS protocol. It said restriction. He knew what his AKI rates were before he did that. He started using that protocol and he said, my rates of AKA went up and I didn't feel good about this and I changed my practice and my rates went back down. So anecdotally, I still think that's a... One of my colleagues who's been speaking at this meeting uh, sent a message around relatively recently that they, they were a little bit shocked because you know, we've been sort of, uh, those of us who are very into this were saying, look, there's loads of patients coming back to the high care surgical environments that are are definitely on the zero to restricted side and many of them on a vasopressor. Whereas I thought we got through the message, just even if you don't believe in the other things we're gonna to come to, that it's okay to be plus one to plus two liters positive at the end of a case. That's a good place to be, not a, a bad place to be. I, I want to raise a, a problem I think is coming around the corner, is I've been listening to many of the critical care discussions and this quite often happens with mission creep, but because of people trying to get people to back off on maintenance fluid in the established critically ill patient, the R word is creeping in to, you know, we must restrict our patients, restrict our patients, which is back to those days of let's not be 10 litres or 5 litres positive perioperatively. So now I can imagine as a trainee, I'm now on intensive care and people are saying restriction is good. And I'm over here and people are saying, some people are telling me restriction is bad. So I, I, I don't know what we do to get that language, but that, there's mission creep there. So you work in... Yeah, I, I, mean, I think one of the problems is, is the... Um, well, I think it was John Louis did the New England Journal four John phases. Yeah. Jean-Louis Vincent. Um, or resuscitation. Optimization. Optimization. Stabilization. Yeah. De-escalation. Or exactly. And, that, and I think early phase, uh, if you've got someone who's really sick, sick it's almost inevitable you're going to end up with a... a overall fluid excess if you're going to maintain intravascular volume because you've got leaky vessels and um, you want to minimize that excess but that's very different from restricting fluids once once things turn around then i think i'm, I'm you know great get rid of the fluid but but only once i don't know whether this is conceptually correct but i i have a sort of image of the glycocalyx slowly regenerating and actually the vessels are going to work now so we can start drying them out that may not be correct, but it seems to work. <laughs> Good so I'm going to switch us to consensus statement 4B, which is the old favourite. It's in almost every guideline because we know it's evidence-based and we strongly recommend it, even though the market penetration still seems to be yeah. interesting. We recommend the use of goal-directed hemodynamic therapy, et cetera, et cetera, because when you either look at the individual trials uh, many of them show reduction in AKI. When you look at the meta-analyses, there's a reduction in AKI. Now, it's not always there, and you can argue about how it's done, but I got the impression, Vicky, you were saying it's part of what you think made a difference. I do. Um, it, so we started using um, regularly. We, of course, we have swans and, you know, all of that, and people were looking at CVP a lot. And it's in cardiac. Which this is in cardiac. Yeah. And I can speak to all different service lines, but let's just go with cardiac. Uh, we started using TEE regularly um, on every case, which then kind of translated into looking at filling and, you know, looking at how optimized were, were the patients. It inadvertently kind of, we 
we went to a goal-directed fluid therapy um, approach, but nobody had to say, let's do this, because it just started to happen, which is great, and everybody pays attention to it now. Now, in other service lines, um, we absolutely use goal-directed fluid therapy. Uh, we we kind of uh, risk stratify, and um, certain cases we, we do not, so you know, really short cases, quick cases, we don't necessarily, but our cases that are greater than two hours, certain comorbidities, things like that. We use goal-directed fluid therapy in every one of those cases and get a lot of pushback sometimes, but at the end of the day, people know it's the right thing to do and it's definitely changed practice because it used to be the restrictive approach on pretty much all cases and now it's, we have to do this and get the right amount. And if, if I may, Vicky, as a, somebody who did plenty of cardiac in the, first, in the past, a lot of my original research was in cardiac fluid balance. Out with cardiac, one of the pushbacks is usually the technology costs extra money. Right. What always struck me in cardiac, particularly in the USA, is you've always got the technology there in front of you. Actually, you've got multiple technologies. So whatever the reason for not doing it is, it can't be the kit right? because you got it. Right. So, yeah. so that does seem to be a recurring theme we're getting from a lot of the people who've almost, they're claiming eliminated acute kidney injury. Now, it's a very bold claim. Mm -hmm. From their cardiac It'd be great. We'll certainly reduced it down <laughs> to close to single numbers Mike. i mean i think this is pretty clear not because of a strongly held belief but just that, i mean the evidence is fairly straightforward whether you do an overall systematic review looking at all sorts of outcomes or the people have done focused ones about renal outcomes it, even the studies which are in inverted commas negative i.e no difference for gold directed fluid therapy uh, i think almost universally show a, an improvement in renal outcomes uh, and and i so I don't think optimised it, though, did it? We'll have to check back on that, because that's one we'll of the large... So that's the Sandham one. study did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the things I bring in... Fedora, mind, which... Sorry, yeah. we're talking trial names now, but Fedora, which is many hundreds done in a... You know, I was close to definitely did. Yeah. Because that was down to the sort of 2% mm -hmm. level again. So one of the things that's bringing in my ears is the, um, the sort of argument that you get that um, gold fluid therapy can't possibly affect long-term outcomes, because we're dealing with an hour or an hour and a half, you know, how could that possibly affect what happens six months later? And I think there are clearly several mechanisms, but this is manifestly a way, from what we now know about the implications of a post-operative acute kidney injury and then acute kidney disease, where, where a little tweak might make a lot of difference down the line. I think it's interesting, you know, because we don't have market penetrance, like there isn't that, not every group, especially in small private practices, can have made the, the value claim for it yet. <laughs> so there's a way around it. But so, you know, we've been in uh, North Star, you know, we have 180 different facilities trying to work with if you don't have access to, you know, the, the um, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, what do you do in its, its place? And it's still goal directed. It's still making sure that you've, um, that you're properly, you know, uh, bolusing your patient at the beginning and, you know, some of the, the strategies that you can use there. So it's in, in instances where we have the monitoring equipment, it is rest, risk stratification because you can't put, we don't have enough to put on every patient. So I think making people aware. And, and for 4A, we've been pivoting off the relief trial, you know, which was the major intra-abdominal non-adult cardiac surgery large trial. That, that was not a, you could argue it was goal-directed, but goal-directed didn't equal, you know, three equals. The, the, the monitor. Mm -hmm. The minority of patients were monitored. It was the goal was in the group that was successful was to give moderately liberal amounts of fluid. Now there is a sub-study that's come out from that. I think it's published now, but we've seen the results of the patients who did have cardiac output monitoring. And it, it did sort of point to the physiological difference between the two. You know, there's a difference in cardiac output, stroke mm -hmm. volume. I've got to be careful and get this bit wrong but it backed up the reason that the difference in the amount of fluid might have made a difference was physiologically, biologically, probably because of what we'd expect. I'm gonna segue us in the interest of time onto 4C. Again, you mentioned it, Vicky, the attention to blood pressure. And here we've gone for the map of 65 because that's where the evidence was leading us at the time. We can talk about whether that should be customized for patients with pre-existing hypertension. We've gone for a C there and a weak recommendation, because it's a weak recommendation in the context of we know it's going to prevent the AKI. Mm -hmm. And as I remember for the discussions, is the wariness here, is you can keep blood pressure up the right way and you can keep blood pressure up the wrong way, right. and we don't know which is the right way for the kidney. 
we're suspicious that you'd have to address volume flow and pressure, like the goal-directed trials, but we can't make that statement recommendation. It drives me crazy to think about when I was an ICU nurse <laughs> and uh, we would have our septic patients and they were hypotensive and we would just put them on whatever, dopamine, you know, levofed, whatever that was, and we weren't really giving them any fluid. And it pains me to think about what we did to those patients. And, um, you know, still when I see it, and now I'm not a CRNA, so I can't tell the CRNAs what to do, but thankfully we have great discussions and they kind of arrive at their own ending. But when we see hypotensive patients and I see very high doses of um, neosinephrine in the OR and their blood pressures come up and there's no fluid and they come out of the OR in a negative balance and then it's like, okay, now we have to have a little talk about this and, and really talk through it as a case study. Um, you know, it's not a bad thing. It, it actually brings a lot of awareness, but um, I, I do think that we sometimes absolutely do it the wrong way. And back to your point about customized map, I think that there should be customized map because again, you know, we see patients who do have a history of hypertension and 65 may not be okay for them. They need it a little bit more. Probably. <laughs> I guess the, the, the thing we don't have here, we've got lots of inferential information from big epidemiological mm -hmm. studies and some smaller trials. And, and I guess you can take some inferential information from the gold to third therapy studies because there's, there's quite a lot of rich data in there. But, but we don't really have the big trials in the way that I think we do for gold to third therapy. Having said that, we've got two more coming in the next <laughs> year or so, yeah. so we're going to be clearer next time we're speaking. I, you know, I, to me, it's just about education and making sure that even if that's not the exact answer, we know that we, you know, need volume flow pressure. And so we just kind of continue, as I said before, beating that drum <laughs> to, to make sure that everyone understands what that means. It's good to be a bore about it. We, we do know that you, although you can transiently rob Peter to pay Paul, you can shift some fluid around and make the numbers look pretty. It's only a transient survival phenomenon. It's not a long-term survival phenomenon. So if you don't correct the volume, you will pay a price. And I think we get wrapped up in the absence of evidence mm. arguments. So, so if you want to have a, what, what would I like to, done to me on a balanced judgment of the information I have? It appears that if you have a low blood pressure, bad stuff happens. I'd prefer not to have a low blood pressure. Uh, and and we're, not do, we're not framing the trial question as, is it better for the kidneys to have a low blood pressure? Because in that case, you just say, well, let's do my high blood pressure. So, yeah. so we, we simply don't know for sure, but the inference would for sure be keep the pressure up. And we can come, it's another discussion for another day about if you have good volume and you have good flow, is the pressure as important? Because you're probably getting to the cells, but that's a longer conversation for another day. We'll go for 4D, and with 4D, there's a recent twist, which again, I, I think is a potential contamination of critical care data into the operating room. 4D is we recommend the perioperative use of balanced crystalloids rather than 0.9% saline. To reduce the risk of postoperative AKI, we've graded the evidence C and a strong recommendation. Vicky. Yeah, we have a, I, I, we have a problem with this. I see a lot of normal saline um, being given, although it's not in our protocols. Uh, LR is in the protocol, but I still, it's kind of the default, I think, and I, I'm not really sure I understand that piece. Um, still trying to work through it. I do like this, though, because um, this has been a point of discussion, like I said, well, this whole paper about three weeks ago, and this point did come up, and it's just practice. It's just what people tend to go to, and I, again, I don't really understand it, but trying to make small incremental changes there. So. I'm not saying it happens universally in <laughs> Southampton. It, it certainly doesn't, but I think this is relatively straightforward. There's, a, there's an evidence base, and it, harm is, like, why wouldn't you? Right. We'll come back to that one in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, we, you know, for us, I feel like this is, of all these different things, this is probably one that's been adopted more quickly than some other, you know, other practices. Uh, I mean, every once in a while we still come across someone using saline in kind of a, you know, a remote site, but for the most part we're doing it. Monty, we're having a really good conversation about this and you were talking about it. Well, we, we, <laughs> well we, get, we are going to be talking to John Myberg. Is it tomorrow morning we're talking to yep. John? Yep. Uh, well, yep. legendary clinical trialists, very much in the critical care space because there has been published relatively recently a massive, you know, saline versus balanced crystalloid study in the established critically ill patients. 
And the conclusion from that was no difference. But there was, there was a signal of harm, you could argue an anticipated signal of harm, in patients with brain problems because lactated ringers is relatively high, or whatever derivative of that you use, is usually relatively hyperosmolar. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's always that caveat risk of swelling the brain. Now, I thought in all of our guidelines, we'd said don't go there, including our NICE guidance. I thought we'd said that, and I thought that was relatively common practice. But that's what you're going to get some pushback again, because people are gonna say, aha, massive trial, it didn't make a difference. There's then a much longer conversation about, well, that's critical illness. How much fluid did they get compared to the operating room where some of the trials people were getting five, six liters of fluid, you know, in, in, in a bleeding situation. But anyway, uh, from our perspective, I think the change was relatively straightforward. Uh, and apart from that caveat the whole time about osmoles and the brain, which might be pertinent in cardiac, I don't think we're going to go back. So last one should be very quick, colloid versus crystalloid. We, we, it says here, insufficient evidence exists to make a recommendation regarding the choice of crystalloid or colloids for volume expansion, and it's ungraded. So, Vicky. From my perspective, our approach in my group and the um, institutions that we're in, I mean, primary is, is crystalloid. Colloid, we reach for when it needs to be reached for, but not, we don't typically use a ton of colloid. I don't think we need to be frightened of colloid. And I think being frightened of it can be harmful. And, and I think probably most of us have come across situations where less experienced folks have been told it's a poison and are resuscitating uh, without much effect with a crystalloid when actually just a couple of bags of colloid would probably make a dramatic difference. Uh, and my, so critical care, I think there's a good literature that if you give too much, you can cause plenty of harm. But the same is true. Irrespective of the type of colloid. So the albumin, the, the toxic signal from albumin is possibly greater than starch or gelatins or whatever it was. But it's, it's it's new, nuanced by yeah. type of colloid, but equally the, some of the volumes are pretty substantial. Yeah. You give too much of a beta blocker or volatile anaesthetic, it's easy enough to kill someone. So yeah. I, I think, you know, in, in the mind is only the, the perioperative literature, and the, uh, Mike James probably saw it it's just come out systematic review just skin. now, is, is that signal is not there because it's... Uh, it's a different clinical context and it's a different different dosing approach. And actually, there's a, if anything, the flickers are a benefit. Yes, yeah, so, so just to be clear to everyone, we, we're continuing to try and distinguish the elective perioperative literature from the trauma literature, from the non-elective, you know, uh, septic belly literature, of which there isn't much, which is, but it's almost definitely going to be different biology, etc., from established critical illness. They are four distinct, let's call them disease processes, because if they're not, we've written a lot about why they're very different. So we, we either, they're either they are very different or they're not very different. That's right. I would just say from a private practice perspective, I think trying to make people realize and re kind of think about that, whatever you're giving, whether it's a, a crystalloid or a collo colloid, those are drugs and we have to you know, consider how much we're giving of each and how we're dosing that. I think for us, uh, and from just the enhanced recovery perspective, colloid in a lot of those protocols was used as bolusing and, you know, crystalloids was, was maintenance. And I think for the places that were allowed to use albumin in the first instance, because that's kind of what we have obviously in, in the U.S., um, I think, you know, they would use that. And that is continuing to be used as bolus, uh, bolus dosing and then crystalloids as maintenance. I don't know if there's a whole lot of conversation about you know the difference right now. I just want to touch very briefly on the novel biomarkers of renal injury. So Biomaria sponsoring this, clearly one of the companies that has brought a, a cell arrest marker, which we'll learn more about later in the meeting, uh, to such that we can now use it clinically. There's uh, other biomarkers, which I think have been approved, things like NGAL, and these are contributing to the current biomarker we use, which is creatinine, because creatinine is a biomarker, as urine output is a biomarker. But we're hearing results, which we'll see some of them later in the meeting, of people proactively using these markers that are well in advance of creatinine rises. And they're heading off, they believe, the acute kidney injury and almost completely eliminating it. Vicky, do you have any experience, or are you with the rest of us, that we'd like to try and see if it's true or not. I, I wish I could say I did. Uh, it's a, a 
product, a tool we've been trying to get into our institution for a while now. I think we're actually starting to make some headway. Um, but even though we've dropped our AKI rate, there's always room for improvement. And I think if we can head it off, um, we would be better for it. The patients would be better for it. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Mike? No, no direct experience, very intrigued by what I've heard from the, the guys who are starting to run trials of biomarker driven therapy. Same. Same. So, and we are very keen, to, we are trying, I think, some patients because I think one of the great challenges looking at the data where people have made a difference is at least get approval to run 100 patients, if you see what I mean. And if there's nothing to see here, let's throw a party, you know, no AKI around here. Well done us. If there is a signal there, maybe we're going to rethink again. Once we've got the no AKI creatinine, then we'll look at the biomarkers. So the prevention of new or worsening CKD following an episode of POAKI, acute kidney injury or AKD, is a public health priority. So they're suggesting, and I've seen some data from the US recently, that the consequences of patients going on to become get chronic kidney disease and dialysis dependent, the quantum, financial quantum related to that, you know, the, the misery for them, but also the financial burden of looking after them, is so massive that we ought to do everything possible, not just for the individual, but for the provision of healthcare overall to head it off. And they were suggesting in here, and I'll take you straight to the lateral bit, the post-AKI recovery greater than 90 days. My takeaway was that we're supposed to communicate to the patient that you've had AKI, you may have AKD. You need to be followed up by your physician. We write to your family physician or however it works, and we say that within a period of time, you need your creatinine rechecked because it's either come down or not come down, and you need your urine dipstick. And Mike, why do you need your urine dipstick done? Because you might have protein in there. <laughs> protein is a sign of sick kidneys. I mean, if you, you, normal granulus does not let protein through, so you know it's, it's a marker of kidney injury. So really, really, you could argue complex to get it done, but simple challenge. You, you go back for your regular health checkup bloods. Your creatinine is either back down or not back down. You pee in a pot, and as John Powell quite rightly said, it's easier to get blood than it is to get urine. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to cross that bridge, and it's dipstick, good old-fashioned dipstick, and it's either got protein in it or not. Where are you with that, Vicky? That's I a honestly, big challenge. I honestly don't know. I, I'm going to be, yeah, I don't know where we are with that. I mean, I know we followed these patients 90, 90 days out, uh, consistency and follow up on that when, you know, I'm rounding up patients and they had never even heard that they had AKI. I, I don't think it's happening, really. I could be wrong. I mean, we're not doing it. But I think the strong recommendation is entirely justified. I mean, you could argue simply on a duty of candor basis. Yes. If, if yeah. you know you've got something that is bad coming down the road that we may have at least contributed to, we should be obliged to, to share that information, in which case, as a patient, you'd be saying, so what do we do about it? And, and we, I think we know what the next step is. And I think to, to that point, like for the patient to figure out, we need to figure out a way to communicate what that means, because as to Vicky's point, not understanding what AKI is at all and, and putting, empowering them maybe to help follow up as well. It's going to be a joint effort for sure. Yeah, I, I started off a conversation thinking we can never do this. And then I thought, well, of course we can do this. We address diabetes, we address blood pressure. And I think the duty of candor discussion, and we'll get into that later in the week with discussions uh, coming to us from patient advocacy groups that when these things happen to individuals we have a duty of candor to say you know uh, let's not talk about fault or anything like that but during your care your kidneys took a little hit and you need to understand that because they should get better but you need to make sure they get better and if they're not getting better you need to go talk to someone desiree back to you yeah no uh, great conversation uh, i think it's always good to look at the evidence and then kind of talk about how we use that in practice because that's what we're all, uh, it's what it's all about. So thank you so much for listening wherever you are in the world. We appreciate you joining us. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also don't forget Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that 
If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now. <laughs>